welcome everyone to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the museum's public programs manager and I'm really excited to be joined by a dear friend of the museum, Hannah Case. Um, hey Hannah, <laughs> we've already met you briefly today. Um, and I'll just make a note that Hannah has actually volunteered for the museum's events and school programs. And it's just been really fun to watch her own museum career develop and have her partner up with us on this program. So welcome back, Hannah. And um, I've uh, also seen a very cute picture of you uh, at a field trip yourself when you were a young, a young okay. one in Santa Cruz. <laughs> Love. Yes, yes. I uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz, and I have a very cute uh, picture that when I was volunteering with the Santa Cruz Museum that I shared with them of me in second grade uh, learning about the Ohlone tribes of the area. And one of the um, uh, people in the tour put a basket on my forehead, yeah. and I'm very much, ooh, like, what's on my head? I'm very used to this. And so it's a very, very funny and awkward picture. Yeah. Ooh. Still a favorite, yeah. <laughs> I've loved him ever since I've been going, since I was uh, a wee little babe. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you um, continue to connect with us via things like this. And before I hand things over to you, um, Hannah, I'm just going to say a couple other things. Um, so we do want to acknowledge that the museum resides on the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. And today these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsin tribal band whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. And the Amamutsin are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts in the Amamutsin Land Trust. Um, I also want to make sure that we point out that tonight's presentation is in support of the museum's 34th annual science illustration exhibit, The Art of Nature, which is featuring over 30 local artists, including Hannah, who's not super local right now today, um, but as we've learned, is definitely a local from Santa Cruz. Um, and if you have yet to explore the exhibit, you really must. Um, I'll follow up with a link to the virtual exhibit if you don't live close um, to the museum, but also like this Saturday, we're gonna have free admission and a maker's market where you can meet a bunch of the artists from the show. So definitely hope you have an opportunity to check it out. Um, and lastly, just please note that we'll be communicating with you tonight via the chat um, and we'll address your comments and questions at the end, but you can feel free to like type them away frantically throughout as things come up to you. Um, and also, we love to be able to see what everyone is saying. So if you change your default from host and panelists to everyone, then everyone um, tuning in today can see your comments and questions. Um, and we thought it'd be fun to uh, have people take the opportunity to practice using the chat, sharing some of their favorite extinct creatures. And we've gotten a bunch of interesting ones like the saber-toothed tiger, um, Gigantosaurus, uh, Giganotosaurus. I yeah. think it's uh, get Gigan man, gigan man. <laughs> Darn it. it, it's one of those. I'm pretty sure it, it people pr they pronounce it as Gigantosaurus, but it's Giganotosaurus. All right, <laughs> I defer to you, um, and I'll I'll stop butchering the other ones that are in the chat right now. But there's some good ones coming in, um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, and um, we're gonna be learning about dinosaurs from Hannah today and also through the through the lens of science illustration and from paleo art, which uh, we're so excited about. And one of Hannah's pieces in the show is um, is very much paleo art. So hopefully we'll be able to hear a little bit about that too, but um, why don't you take it away, Hannah? Absolutely, I'm gonna switch over to sharing my screen. Okay, let's get this going. And Hoku, who's, who's coming in the chat with a couple of these ones that I've never heard of, I've heard from other museum staff that Hoku is a big fossil fan and big dinosaur oh fan. So thanks for joining us, Hoku. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, again, my name is Hannah and welcome to my presentation about paleo art and specifically science illustration paleontology. Um, so basically paleo art is the illustration field that combines science illustration and paleontology to create accurate and also engaging imagery of extinct prehistoric creatures. 
So we'll go over the importance of paleo art in science, the general history of dinosaur art in science as well, um, and some processes and tips from me um, going over paleo art and my paleo art process. And also we're gonna go over some major hot topics from the world of paleontology. Um, and then after that, we'll have time for your questions, which I'm very excited about. And I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking. And so let's get going here. So firstly, a little bit about me. Um, as you know, I am a Santa Cruz native and I work now at the Claremont Museum, uh, Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology um, in Southern California. And I'm a certified science illustrator from the Cal State Monterey Bay grad program. And uh, I actually, for my first occupation at the museum, I was a science illustration intern uh, following my uh, certification at CSUMB. Um, and so now I work as a outreach assistant. So I do a little bit of everything about around the museum. And, uh, and I also want to point out before we get into any big paleontology, things. Um, I want to make sure that you guys know that my background is in biology and evolution, and I am not a certified uh, bona fide paleontologist or an expert in specific dinosaurs. Um, but I am well equipped to answer any general questions that you have about paleontology and history of life on Earth. Um, so keep those questions in mind, or if you don't have any questions now, that's cool. They'll come to you by the end, um, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. All right, so I've already mentioned the word paleo art a couple of times. So what does that mean? Uh, basically, paleo art is paleontology plus art is paleo art. And it's an overarching term that essentially describes the paleontological reconstruction of an ancient species into a scientifically accurate visual form. So what that means is basically any kind of art that depicts ancient life all the way from 3.5 billion years ago ish when life started, uh, all the way to the Holocene epoch, so about 10,000 years ago. And paleo art is a facet of science illustration. Um, and just as science illustration covers all of science, paleo art itself is just the little itty bit that covers paleontology. Pop quiz. Are you ready? Well, that's okay if you want. That's fine. I didn't mention there was going to be a pop quiz, so I won't break you. But I do want you guys to think about this question. Um, so if paleo art is more inclined to be very scientific and literature heavy, which depiction of these two dinosaurs do you think is more closely aligned to science illustration of paleo art? Is it Velociraptor or the other Velociraptor? And you're probably right. I'm pretty sure you guys were all guessing the one by Rob Soto. Yes, that one is the more accurate Velociraptor, it is paleo art. Um, and so you have to remember that the big difference between paleo art and dinosaur art um, is that paleo art uh, makes sure that every aspect of the illustration is as close to scientific literature as possible. On the other hand, um, there are very talented artists who make their dinosaur interpretations to fit an audience um, to make it look scary, like in Jurassic Park. Um, and so that interpretation from Jurassic Park basically falls into creature design, which is an amazing field with a lot of amazing, amazing artists. Um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily follow science. And while some of them do, sometimes there is creature design that does borrow from life and science. It's not necessarily accurate, but it does make movies fun. I mean, scary velociraptors for sure. Uh, and as for the real Velociraptor, uh, you'd be surprised to know that they were completely covered in feathers um, since birds are directly related to raptors and theropods. Uh, they got their feathers from them. And, uh, and they also were only three feet tall Velociraptors, uh, which is definitely a difference from Jurassic Park Velociraptors, which were very large. So you can think of Velociraptors as actually being little kind of on the size of turkeys and probably a little bit more ferocious. Still kind of scary though, right? Okay, so you might ask, why is science illustration important? Why is paleo art important? Why is it necessary to draw dinosaurs? Well, all of science illustration is important in conveying scientific information and paleo art is essential in portraying ancient extinct life simply because it is the only way to see these species come to life. 
And similar in the way that uh, we look at quantum level mechanics and processes or the internal anatomy of stars or even DNA re replicating and transcribing. These are processes and things we cannot see uh, to our eye. And so we have to rely on uh, paleo art to see dinosaurs. And uh, until we can travel back in time or somehow resurrect dinosaur DNA from Jurassic Park style, you know, to make dinosaurs, which is not going to happen. So um, we have to rely on paleo art to see dinosaurs. And so here's a really brief history of paleontology. Uh, so basically all throughout human civilization, there has been records of people uh, finding fossils and uh, discovering them and including uh, Greek philosophers all the way back and then uh, naturalists from China and Persia in the middle ages. And paleontology as a field of study though was really only coming into being around uh, 1800. And you can see right here, this really cool illustration from Georges Cuvier, pardon my French, there's gonna be a couple French names that I'm going to put you here. Um, Georges Cuvier was one of the first people um, to make a paper in paleontology where he showed this illustration of a mastodon uh, mammoth jaw uh, in relation to a Indian elephant jaw. Um, and he made this illustration or he made this paper in 1796. So just about the time of when paleontology was just getting started. And the actual term paleontology was actually coined by this French guy. Here comes another butchering of this French word. Henri Marie de Coutte de Blainville uh, coined the term paleontology in 1822. And paleontology meaning paleo old or ancient and ology means kind of up. And basically after a lot of fossils were being dug up in the 1800s and then also Darwin's Origin of Species being published in 1859, paleontology really skyrocketed. And as paleontology skyrocketed, so did paleo art and the beginnings of paleo art started happening. And so here is Henry de la Beche's A More Ancient Dorset from 1830. And this was actually a really cool piece because Henry was a paleontologist who studied uh, Mary Anning's fossils from the south coast of England of uh, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. And looking at the fossils, he wanted to create a dynamic showcase of these animals, showing them in their environment as they once lived. And so while this is one of the first true instances of paleo art, um, it's also a really interesting piece in the sense that it is showing a very dynamic and engaging general ecosystem with interspecies interactions. Um, so this was a very kind of revolutionary piece of the time. And as we move into um, basically the classic paleo art stage or phase of time, uh, which was from the Victorian era, all the way to the late 1960s. This was when a lot of the dinosaurs that you start to see basically take shape and move away from the static dinosaurs that you might once have seen. Um, and so some of the paleo artists who basically started and were at the forefront of this time period were Rudolf Zallinger and Charles Knight. And so Charles Knight was really cool because he was a wildlife artist who was staunchly in favor of drawing from real life, um, which is an interesting challenge when you draw prehistoric creatures. And so what he did, which was very revolutionary, was basically using modern relatives to paint their ancient counterparts. And so one of his first uh, real paleo art pieces was when he painted a ancient pig species. And to do that, he looked at uh, wild boars. And so he, you can see from his, uh, his paintings down at the bottom that his creatures, his dinosaurs basically have a, um, a sense of life about them, a sense that they are more rooted in realism and that they are going about their day. Uh, and you can see up at the top, there's Zallinger, Rudolf Zallinger. Sorry, it's a little bit out of focus, but this piece is huge. It is a huge, huge fresco that Rudolf Zallinger made um, in five years, five years, uh, and he finished in 1947. And it's called the Age of Reptiles, and it's still in the Yale Peabody Museum today. I have not yet seen it. Um, I will eventually see it because it's supposed to be a groundbreaking interpretation of paleo art at that time. 
Um, and it was very much uh, right on top of the current literature and uh, it was very accurate to what they believed at the time. Um, eventually I will love to see it. Speaking of paleo art, I could not help putting this slide in because Disney's Fantasia is uh, essentially was one of the first introductions I had to paleontology when I was four years old when I first watched it at Christmas. And uh, I put it in because basically um, it's an interesting piece of, essentially people don't know, Fantasia is one of Disney's films from 1940. And it is composed of multiple classical music pieces uh, with animation accompanying them. And the Rite of Spring piece is very much out of step from the rest of the film, which includes uh, the Nutcracker Suite with uh, dancing flower uh, fairies and ostrich ballerinas and Mickey Mouse with a wizard hat. Uh, it's very, very different. And uh, that's what makes it special because Disney, when he was in the process of making Fantasia, he was adamant that he wanted to have a totally accurate representation of ancient life in his film. And so to that end, he collaborated with major science, scientists and biologists and paleontologists at the time, including Barnum Brown, who was the man who found T-Rex bones uh, in the first place. And he worked uh, for a very long time at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And Edwin Hubble, who uh, you might recognize as a very famous astronomer. And he had a very famous telescope satellite named after him. Um, and then Julian Huxley, who's also in that picture on the left, and he was a biologist, a uh, very well-known biologist at the time, and he also later in life uh, started the World Wildlife Fund, which is pretty cool. Um, and so, of course, as you're watching this film, this sequence, uh, there are definitely flaws in the story um, compared to what we know now, uh, such as T-Rex fighting a stegosaurus, which, as we know, T-Rex lived millions of years after Stegosaurus. They did not know each other. Um, and also the extinction event uh, at the end of the uh, sequence was where the dinosaurs was caused by a giant drought, which we know also is not the case. Um, but you have to remember that this was a huge shift in film for how the public perceived dinosaurs. And it, it definitely uh, moved away from the sluggish, dim-witted kind of dinosaur entertainment um, that was around at the time. I still love this one. <laughs> All right, and so I've already mentioned it just a second ago. Um, of course, with older paleo art pieces, you might notice that some of the illustrations are a little off. They're just a little off. And uh, that's because that they're just not accurate anymore, which is unfortunate for them. But while they might look comically off base now, you have to remember, that by its very nature, paleontology is always changing depending on the newest evidence, the newest discoveries and findings. Um, and so as with all science, only time will uncover more and more facts. And just as we might laugh at these depictions of uh, aquatic brontosauruses and sluggish T-Rexes, uh, people maybe in the future might laugh at illustrations of paleo art that we do today because they will know of discoveries that we have not yet comprehended. Um, and so it's nice to give these older paleo art pieces a little bit of grace. Uh, and so you can see though that especially the Iguanodon piece, which is from 1854, um, these are actually beautiful sculptures uh, that were made for the Crystal Palace exhibition. And you can actually still see them today in London at the Crystal Palace Park. And um, this was around the time when Iguanodon was first discovered as a fossil. And Sir Richard Owen uh, basically designed the fossil with um, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, who was the, sculpt the sculptor. And uh, Richard Owen had, I think it was a fairly fragmentary fossil. It was not a complete fossil. So he worked with what he had. And so he interpreted Iguanodon to basically be a large iguana. And we know that's not the case today. As you can see, uh, this illustration uh, from 2008 is more what Iguanodon would actually look like. Um, so definitely not a large iguana. And also you can see too, the aquatic uh, brachiosauruses, um, for a very long time actually, a lot of paleontologists um, proposed that uh, because they were so large, it was only, the only option for these large sauropods uh, to move about was to live in water. 
And we now know today that that was not the case, um, that they could actually support themselves on land uh, because they have hollow bones and a network of air sacs in their vertebrae, similar to birds today, um, that allowed them to be uh, so big and very light, lighter than you would anticipate. Um, and then T-Rex, of course, is a classic uh, paleo art piece. Um, it is slow and sluggish and dim-witted. And uh, we know that's definitely not the case. Uh, we know that from brain endocasts of T-Rex, which means um, taking plaster and filling in the inside of the fossil skull to see what the brain shape looks like, paleontologists can look at the size of the brain lobes and determine um, basically how smart it was. And they knew from that that T-Rexes were actually pretty smart and they were smart hunters and they had uh, very good senses of smell and of, of visual cues. They were very good at seeing, unlike uh, Jurassic Park would tell you. Um, and they also, as well, were covered in feathers. And we know that for a fact because uh, Guanlong, which I'll have a paleo art piece later down the line that you'll see, Guanlong is a uh, early relative of Tyrannosaurids that lived in China. And there were some beautiful fossils that were discovered about 20-ish years ago, um, showing Guanlong with feathers. And uh, basically paleontologists put two and two together that if Guanlong, which is an ancient relative of T-Rexes and Tyrannosaurus, if, if it had feathers, then most likely Tyrannosaurus did too. So did T-Rex. So that's how we know that T-Rex had feathers. And so now we're going to move into how I approach my paleo art process. And artists and styles may vary, of course, but for the most part, paleo art has a very simple but straightforward rule of thumb. The more you research, the better your illustration will be. And that's basically it. That's really the bottom line. Um, and so if you want your illustration, your paleo art to be as accurate as possible, you have to look into as many aspects as you can as possible. Um, and Specifically, this is my illustration of a early mammal skull. Um, it's called uh, Morganicodontid, which is kind of a mouthful. And uh, it was an early mammal that was very small and lived in the Jurassic in Wyoming. And this is basically uh, an interpretation of a fossil fragment of its skull um, that Brian Davis and his team found um, last year. And I illustrated what the rest of the skull would have looked like around the fragment that they found. And it's an entirely new species to science, which is amazing. And Brian published his paper about in March with my illustration in it. And I couldn't be more honored to be uh, a part of the project and to be one of the first to draw the full mammal. Because as we know, I love fossil mammals. Yes, so basically my paleo art process is before I do anything, before I make any sketches, I research. And I research a lot. And so the number one thing that I do is I research, uh, I do general Google search um, on Google and I look up um, general science sites about my subject, about the species that I'm looking at. And even Wikipedia is very helpful as well. And once I feel comfortable with that, then I look into um, Google Scholar. So Google Scholar is a search engine that basically um, it goes into the published scientific works of a specific species or creature that you're looking into. And so the research papers really delve into the more scientific understanding of my subject that I'm looking at. And this is where my background in biology and science really helps because a lot of the papers are very dense and scientific. Um, and so it's really nice to uh, look into that and have that knowledge already going in. Um, and then with that, I look at the imagery of the fossil. Uh, so if in those papers, there are actual pictures of the fossil itself, of the species of fossil, um, and or if there is any diagrams or imagery already, then I'll look at that and I'll start doing my beginning sketches. And what can be really helpful too, though, is that if your subject has an incomplete fossil, uh, which is often very common because most fossils that you find in the field are fairly fragmentary and partial. And so if you do have a partial fossil, then it's good to look up relatives of that fossil, of that species, and uh, make an educated guess with their anatomy to fill in your missing anatomy. 
Um, and better yet, if your, if your species has a modern relative, you can actually look them up and that's really helpful. And so if you say uh, we're illustrating a Velociraptor like we saw before, but you don't really have good visual cues for what its feet look like, well, you could look up turkey feet or ostrich feet because they are directly related to raptors and theropods uh, over a few million years, of course. And so they have very dinosaur-like feet. And so I use uh, bird feet all the time when I'm illustrating dinosaurs. Um, and so it's good to look up modern relatives if you can. And then uh, once you're done with your initial species look, then if you're doing a background as well, um, then you have to look up the literature of the environment in which these species lived in. And this can really get you into a rabbit hole of looking up fossil plants, fossil insects, fossil um, of different species that live nearby of different dinosaurs, of weather and climate patterns and dirt textures and so many other details. Um, so, but remember, it's really the best thing for you if you research as much as you can, you'll uncover the most facts and it'll be, uh, it'll make your paleo art perfect. And it's also really good to use slightly more roundabout means of uh, figuring out the correct details of your subject like making a clay maquette or like a little sculpture of what you're drawing and then see how the light hits it or what the shadow makes. And um, also too, looking up images of unrelated animals, like if you're drawing a triceratops, um, but you're not quite sure how well it stands on its feet, how well it just kind of stands and stands in place. Then what I do in the past is look up uh, just cows, images of cows. Because uh, they're almost the same size, and but they hold themselves in a very similar manner, and so that's what I like to use sometimes to correct myself. And here's the very important last tidbit, if you can, is to ask an expert. Um, so reach out to a paleontologist or a dinosaur expert by email, and most of them will be very happy to answer any of your questions that you might have, and even look over some art that you have so far and correct it for you. And I love that because if you have an expert that gives you the okay for your paleo art, then you know that your paleo art is as close to literature as possible. And so here is a pretty straightforward, um, very simplistic kind of perspective of how you get all of your pieces, all of your pieces of information together and create your uh, paleo art piece. And so you can see here, um, basically me compiling my papers and the fossil specimens and also anatomical diagrams of that species to create my version of the Lord. And you can see in the corner too, um, that is Scott Hartman's anatomical diagram of a leptoceratops. Uh, and Scott Hartman is actually a really amazing science illustrator, paleo artist who has made a plethora of paleontology and uh, dinosaur anatomical figures. And I know for a fact that a lot of paleo artists use his uh, anatomical figures as a really good base for making dinosaur art. And so this is my reconstruction, the life reconstruction of a leptoceratops, which is a small relative of the triceratops. It's a little guy. And I made this during my internship at the Alpha Museum. And I made it for Dr. Andy Farkey, who is the director of the museum. Um, I made it for his research poster for the Society of Verbic Paleontology uh, Conference in 2020. And so he is an expert in ceratopsians, which means triceratops and other triceratops relative to like leptoceratops. And so he was really helpful in bringing this piece to life. And so I also want to point out too that not all paleo art is super highly rendered and super, super detailed. A lot of paleo art can be very simplistic and diagrammatical because as in all science illustration, the purpose of your piece of your illustration is to effectively convey information. And it does not have to be super detailed to do so. As long as it is showing to your audience the scientific information that you want to portray, then that is good. And so you can see here that this on the left is my, um, basically these diagrams of uh, fossil bones in an ornithomimid dinosaur. Um, and so it might look like a bunch of colored blobs, uh, but it's actually really important showing the differences in anatomy of different ornithomimids. 
And on the right is a really cute little triceratops that I absolutely love that I made for elementary school groups at the Alpha Museum, showing how uh, fossilization happens, showing how a dinosaur becomes a fossil. Um, and so as you can see from these two pieces that all that really matters from your paleo art is that it is clear and concise and it does not have to be the next Mona Lisa to be a uh, perfect paleo art, as long as it conveys the right information. All right, so this is an old piece that uh, is, makes me cringe every time I see it. <laughs> but it's really cool though, because it's one of my first instances of paleo art and I included it in my portfolio for the science illustration graduate um, certification program that I went to. And uh, I do cringe at this piece, but it is okay. Um, it does have a lot of things going for it. I remember researching all of the species in this piece um, down to the creatures and the plants and the weather, uh, everything was important. And um, so the paleo, paleo art process was okay. Uh, but so in, when I was in the grad program, I decided to revisit this piece um, and ask Aunt Dr. Andy Farkey for his expert opinion on how to render it once again uh, to be more correct. Um, and so you can see this is version one and then version two. So you can see if I jump back and forth that it's basically the same scene, but the big difference is the Guanlong dinosaur. This is the early, early Tyrannosaur relative. Uh, the reason why we know that T-Rexes had feathers. And you can see that in my previous iteration that I had Guanlong's arms up a little bit higher than this one. And Dr. Farkey was very quick to notice that the Guanlong's arms had to be much lower uh, because they actually sat much lower down the rib cage than I had them. And the hands of the Guanlong could not point downwards like this. They were actually unable to do this with their hands. And instead they always were upright like this, kind of like they're always doing a thumbs up like that. Um, and so my research failed to show me that because I most likely saw other artists showing Guanlong with their arms higher up and the hands going like this. And I, I followed their lead without looking into it. And so this is a really good example of my last tip of the paleo art process in asking a expert because uh, that can really make or break your piece. And who knows, maybe after I ask the expert of fossil uh, Jurassic mammals um, in China uh, or the expert of plants in China, you know, we'll see. If I ask all these experts, maybe I'll make a new piece again and it can be super duper accurate to science, which I would love. And so this is a more new project that I've been doing, which is uh, Paleolagus Haydeni life re restoration. And so essentially, um, this is a little ancestor uh, of rabbits and pikas of North America that lived about 35 million years ago in Wyoming. And I was inspired to bring this animal to life because I was uncovering its skull in the prep lab here at the Alpha Museum. And after I took the skull out of its rock casing, I felt inclined to bring it back to life as it once lived. And so these next few pictures show my painting process essentially. And so I usually start with a pencil sketch at the bottom, and then I make a watercolor as a base uh, for all of my colors and basically give it a little bit of form and function so I figure out where everything is going. And then I fill up the background with gouache paint uh, and I work from the far back, the background, and then I move forward. Um, and so this makes it possible to paint plants on top of your paintings as you go. So it looks more um, sequential and natural versus if you were to paint from the front all the way to the back, you would have to paint plants and then you'd have to paint around the plants that you just painted. So it's it's more tricky to do it that way. So if you are painting with gouache, it's better to work from the far, far back to the front. And so as much as I wanted to paint the little rabbits first, I had to wait until the background was finished. And so this is the somewhat complete version. Um, I probably have a little bit more to uh, mix it up and see what happens. Uh, maybe add a little bit, few more details. Uh, we'll see. But for the most part, I really enjoyed the process, and uh, it was really super fun to uh, bring this little fossil mammal uh, back to life and how uh, it lived possibly with its family members in Wyoming. Who knows? All right, we're going to move into hot topics.
paleontology, or to paraphrase it, new findings in paleontology. So for me, I always get super excited about new findings in paleontology because it helps me to adapt and refine my paleo art pieces in real time. And so now that we know how a paleo artist sets up their process, um, we'll break down these new findings and hypothesize uh, if you all were paleo, uh, paleo artists, uh, how you would go about painting um, after these scientific fossils, after these amazing discoveries. All right, so here we have the first one, which is Spinosaurus's dense bones. And so as you know, Spinosaurus is a pretty famous dinosaur. Maybe some of your favorite dinosaurs, maybe some of you. Um, and so Spinosaurus for quite a while has had a debate surrounding it in the paleontology community, in the paleontology academic world, whether or not Spinosaurus was aquatic or terrestrial. So did it hunt and live in the water or did it hunt and live on the land? And so there has been a lot of debate about it, um, varying from the shape of its tail, uh, which a lot of paleontologists uh, posit that was a really good tail for swimming um, versus other paleontologists say that, oh no, it's, it's ankle bones show that it was actually terrestrial and could only walk on land. So there's a lot of debate surrounding it, but this particular paper shows that Spinosaurus had very dense bones related to, um, in comparison to its other relatives of other Spinosaurids that were more terrestrial. And so you can see from the scans of the inside of the bones, they're almost completely dense compared to other bones of its uh, relatives, which are more hollow on the inside. And so what does that mean? Why did why, why did dense bones matter? Well, if you recall, the convergent evolution between Spinosaurus and marine mammals is actually quite acute because marine mammals have very dense bones. And so when you look at a sea lion or a harbor seal or whales or the sea cow, uh, like the one that hangs in the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, you'll notice that the inside of its bones are very, very dense. And so that really helps for the animal to control itself in the water column and make it sink rather than float. And so for Spinosaurus, that means that it could hunt in the water and not be floating around. And so that makes it seem from this particular paper that Spinosaurus is actually quite aquatic. And so if you were a paleo artist, put on your paleo artist hat, um, if you were to make paleo art of this particular species with this paper in mind, um, it would probably be best to paint this uh, or draw this Spinosaurus in the water, hunting in the water. And I'd probably look at pictures of crocodiles or manatees uh, showing them floating in the water column to get a good idea of, um, of how the Spinosaurus would have uh, sat and floated or not floated in the water. Um, and so uh, it would make more sense to not draw a Spinosaurus on land, hunting on land, um, because this paper says that it was more likely that they were in water. So if you were following this paper and its scientific findings, you would have Spinosaurus in the water. All right, and here is a really cool uh, paper that I absolutely love um, because this deals with fossil footprints. And footprints are what are known as trace fossils. And so that's different from other fossils like body fossils that you'll see in museums because in museums, you'll mostly see body fossils, which are bones or claws, basically the anatomical remains of an ancient creature um, and versus trace fossils where actually uh, they're essentially the hints of an animal uh, that it left behind. And so in this case, fossilized footprints. And uh, footprints themselves are fairly rare. So it's pretty rare to find fossil footprints of dinosaurs, but it's even more rare to find footprints of a dinosaur that had a limp, that had a injured foot. And that's what makes this paper so amazing um, is that it could find, it was able to find this amazing, super, super rare fossil. And it tells a really unique story of this animal in a way that a body fossil would not, um, because there is no, there's practically no way that we would be able to find uh, this specific dinosaur's foot. It's 
very, very, very unlikely that you would find footprints and also the dinosaur fossil next to it. It's very, very difficult. And so it's, this is really interesting because the footprints show uh, how this dinosaur possibly hurt its foot because of an injury or possibly because it suffered from crooked toes, which is a uh, condition that's actually seen in poultry and chickens uh, and ostriches today. So with theropods and dinosaurs uh, being directly related to birds, it's very likely that they possibly suffered the same, same afflictions that birds would have today. And so if you were to make a paleo art piece about this, it would be probably a little bit tricky because if you look at the paper, you'll see that the paleontologists are actually unsure of who these footprints belong to. They're not quite sure if they belong to an ornithopod um, or uh, a theropod. So the, they think that it possibly could be an ornithopod because um, it has a, from the footprints themselves, they can see that it was a fairly normal gait for an ornithopod to walk despite its injured foot versus it could be a theropod. But if it were theropod footprints, the theropod would have a very large limp as it's walking with its injured foot. And so that's why a lot of paleontologists are unsure if it is one or the other. And so if you were to make a paleo art piece of this particular paper um, with this paper in mind, it would be a great thing to possibly show the two different theories. Uh, you can have an ornithopod walking um, in one image, in one painting or drawing, and then a theropod walking. And you can show the difference in gates and how um, the paleontologists are unsure if it was one or the other, because they could not be quite sure. And I do love this uh, paleo art piece right here on the left, where it shows basically what a normal foot looked like for the footprints and then the footprint itself, and then what the injured foot looked like and the footprint itself. So I really love this paper uh, because of the trace fossil aspect. It's very, very cool. And if you come to the ALF Museum at some point, I'd highly recommend checking this out because we have an amazing collection of fossil footprints, dinosaurs, ancient reptiles, even um, spider footprints, which are my personal favorite. Uh, the spider footprints are actually from 250 million years ago. Um, so we have quite a selection of amazing footprints if you come check us out in Claremont at some point. Okay, so this paper, I have to warn you, is quite a doozy for all those T-Rex fans out there. Um, and so basically this paper uh, outlines that Tyrannosaurus rex had possibly some other relatives in its genus, so other Tyrannosaurus species. And so the uh, paleontologists in this paper basically suggest that uh, due to slight physical differences in uh, the femur bone and the length of incisor teeth across all of these uh, Tyrannosaur specimens that we have uh, today, um, the paleontologists posit that they actually might all be three separate Tyrannosaurus species. So not just T-Rex, but two other Tyrannosaurus species. And so because this involves a very famous dinosaur, um, it caused quite a stir in the paleontology community. As you can see, it was very recent, fairly recent. Um, and so uh, it got pretty heated for sure. There's a lot of people who have their hearts set on what Tyrannosaur looked like and everything. But of course this is science. So science changes uh, as new findings come to light. And so if you were to make a paleo art piece, um, you have to keep in mind that this is a hot button topic. And so you have to be prepared with um, people seeing it and having the paintings. Um, and so if you really want to visually convey this as a paleo artist, I'd probably recommend um, showing a comparison of the three Tyrannosaurus species uh, next to each other. So one, two, three and then outlining um, their anatomy differences. So uh, this species had a longer femur, and this one had a shorter, and this one had a shorter, and then their incisor legs, and blah, blah, blah. And so you show the comparison between the three species and why they are considered three different species. And um, so also, though, a word of caution about this particular paper. Um, from what I gather, the general paleontologist consensus for this paper is that, yes, there is a good possibility that there could have been multiple Tyrannosaurus species, as Tyrannosaurus did encompass a very large range in North America, 
um, it's very likely that there was multiple species. Um, but this particular paper is a little tricky because the evidence given in it is a little bit slim and a little bit subtle to be entirely conclusive. Um, and so if you were to make a paleo art piece about this, uh, this new information specifically, uh, use your discretion and research maybe a little bit more uh, of citations and other paleo paleontological um, counterpoints that experts might have about the topic. Because uh, this is a really good, um, this is a really good example of how in science, how one paper may not be enough to change the outcome of scientific literature. Because in all science, in all aspects of science, in every, in every different facet of science, uh, basically the process is, is that if there is a new, uh, if there is new evidence, then there has to be multiple instances of the same evidence pointing to the same point. And uh, that only then, when you have a huge body of evidence pointing in favor of this new evidence, then it becomes factual. And so at the moment, this paper is just a little bit on the slim side. Um, unless in the next few years, we find more anatomical differences between the three species, then great, that's great. But for the most part, sometimes you have to be a little bit careful with some new papers that come out because they have not been fully supported. Not quite yet, but maybe they will. And then this paper is super cool as well because it includes new evidence that helps to settle the debate whether pterosaurs had feathers. And so pterosaurs technically are not dinosaurs. They are flying reptiles. And so uh, pterosaurs include pterodactyls, um, petzocoatalus, um, that those kinds of creatures. And they are not actually dinosaurs, but uh, new evidence from this particular fossil shows that uh, they actually had feathers. And they had feathers that had melanosomes. Um, which are basically uh, molecular structures within the feather that basically give the feather its color. And so these paleontologists have found that pterosaurs not only had feathers, they also had colored feathers and colored feathers possibly for display uh, or for, you know, looking at us or just for camouflage, you know, uh, any kind, uh, any kinds of those explanations. But so basically, uh, if you were to make a paleo art reconstruction of this particular creature, um, it would be good because most pterosaurs and pterodactyls and all of that in the past have been conveyed as shrink wrapped. And so basically very kind of skinny and scrawny and uh, a little bit like fleshy, not, not very accurate to what we know now. And so it'd be good if you were to make paleo art of this particular pterosaur today, because you can show it having those feathers and you can make your pterosaur fluffy and fuzzy <laughs> with its feathers, because we know from the specimen itself, it did not have flight feathers, which are very much different from downy feathers that birds might have. So pterosaurs did not have flight feathers, but they most likely had quills or downy feathers uh, along their body. And so basically this is a really cool um, instance for how new evidence can really help to enliven and, sh and shift the visual understanding of ancient species for the better. And uh, that's the great thing about paleo art is that the more we learn, the better we can illustrate them these ancient creatures, these beautiful ancient creatures, and try to depict them to reality as much as possible. And so now that my presentation is sadly coming to a close, um, I'm going to bring up a couple of book recommendations. Uh, if you are really interested in paleo art, I highly recommend the Paleo Artist's Handbook by Mark Whitten. Um, I know that a lot, a lot of paleo artists use this particular book and it is very comprehensive and super helpful in every aspect that uh, I've delved into and possibly more. Um, and if you are interested in science illustration, uh, I highly recommend uh, getting the Guild Handbook of Science Illustration, Scientific Illustration. It is the magnum opus, the industry standard for science illustrators. If you love science illustration, this book is essential. Um, and so I highly recommend that. And I also want to point out the amazing paleo artists that I included in my presentation today, uh, including Emily Willoughby, Mauricio Antone, Rob Soto, Gabriel Iweco. All of these people are amazing. And if you can, please follow them on Instagram. 
Uh, I highly recommend going onto Instagram and checking out the Paleo Art community. It's a vibrant and supportive and amazing community of people uh, who all love paleontology just like us and love Paleo Art. And I highly recommend checking them out. And so with that, that's the end of my presentation. So thank you to the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and to Marisa. And uh, thank you for making this event happen. And also for continuing the amazing Art of Nature show every year. It's a highlight of my year. And it's always just so well done and full of so many talented local artists. Um, I absolutely love it. And if you can see it, go see it before it closes in June. Um, and thanks to all of you who came to my presentation uh, and we could share our love of paleontology and paleo art together. Uh, and so with that, I think it's just about time for your guys' questions, which I'm really excited to, to see. Okay. Cool, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, that was amazing. We did, we got, we got a lot of great comments and questions coming in from some dinosaur lovers out there um, and a comment about how great the, the science illustration book from the guild is that you, that you pointed out. Um, and we just got one that came in uh, curious about how you got into this. What made you want to pursue paleo art? Oh, yeah. Well, I probably say that I have been very much um, inspired by paleontology and paleo art since I was very young. Um, I would say that going to the La Brea Tar Pits Museum uh, when I was a kid was a formative experience for me. Um, and I would probably say that, that uh, from that experience, my mom bought in the gift shop this great uh, booklet about uh, saber tooth tigers. <laughs> and I still have it today. And uh, in there is all these amazing um, paleo art uh, illustrations of Smilodon and life around the La Brea Tar Pits uh, around the Pleistocene at that time. And uh, that was very much instrumental for me uh, as I started to uh, start drawing in my childhood and uh, get inspired by paleontology. And in college, I was really uh, inspired by paleontology and I took a paleontology course. And uh, in that course, um, I went up to my teacher on the first day because she had so many beautiful um, slides of paleo artists and paleo art. And I went up to her and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> she was she said wow I actually had a student who was just like you last year who went to this uh, graduate certification program um, in science illustration and he now works at this museum uh, and I said I want to do that and so basically after I graduated uh, from UCSC in evolution and ecology uh, I went to CSUMD for my science illustration certification and from there um, part of the graduation requirement is to make a uh, internship, to do an internship at a place of your choice. And so I heard about the ALF Museum because ALF Museum is really amazing in uh, mentoring young paleo artists like no other institution that I know of. And so I went here and it was absolutely amazing. And I loved it so much I stayed. <laughs> And so I continue uh, my love of paleontology and paleo art here. And uh, it's really fascinating. It's, it's a great blending of both worlds for me. Yeah, and I know that you've, um, you've definitely made science illustrations of other like ex extant um, creatures yeah. as well. Is that something that you envision yourself moving forward with kind of a balance or like hopping around from discipline to discipline? Um, or also uh, you were talking about this idea that like paleo art is really about taking data and like reading through these papers and then interpreting them, which really made me think about data visualization, which comes in so many different forms, um, like thinking about uh, astronomy um, renderings and things like that. Have you, what, what else are you interested in or are you really like focused on paleo art right now? Um, I'd like to say that I'm a Renaissance woman, you know, uh, I, I do love paleontology and paleo art, and I love the opportunity in delving into that. But you know, I also love things that haven't been dead for millions of years. Uh, and I love different processes in science. Um, and so moving forward, uh, I just I love the experience of working with um, any kind of I, I love mammals. 
and uh, any kind of evidence of marine mammals, uh, of, of uh, new research and all of that is just really fascinating to me. And also space is amazing, especially because a lot of space stuff uh, is happening in the next couple of years, especially with the Artemis mission of going to the moon again. I'm super excited about that and going to Mars. There's just a lot of science that continues and will continue. And it's really fascinating and inspiring to me. And I want to be a part of all of it. <laughs> I love science. So any, any kind of science is great for me. Um, we uh, just got a question, another question about kind of like the paleo art um, side of things, but also Hoku has been very active in the chat, um, sharing his insights about dinosaurs. And um, there's been a bit of a debate about T-Rex and feathers. Are you are you familiar with um, with what we might be talking about? Have you have you heard about this? Uh, the T-Rex and feathers debate. Yes. Um, I am fairly versed in T-Rexes and feathers, and <laughs> so I'd love to hear what the chat is going <laughs> Well, Hoku was pointing out that there's like clear fossil evidence that T-Rex had skin um, rather than scales, which would mean that they wouldn't have had feathers. Um, and then I was also just looking, I've I know nothing about dinosaurs, like nothing, um, but I was looking into it a little bit, and it seems like maybe there's a theory that perhaps young um, Tyrannosaurus Rex had some feathers, but then once they got bigger, they didn't need them anymore. Um, and that they had like a scaly skin instead of like just scale or just skin and that there's not, it's not like a hard and fast one or the other. Yeah, yeah. I'm. It is interesting because as I said before, that a lot of the evidence that we have now that uh, proposes that T-Rex uh, had feathers um, is from Guanlong and other early Tyrannosaurids showing feathers in their um, fossils. Uh, and so, yes, it, we do not have any direct evidence. We, there is no T-Rex fossil that we have today that has an outline of feather impressions along the mm -hmm. sides. So yes, it is possible that they did not have feathers, but it is also likely that they did. And so um, it's just in the realm of science to make these um, educated guesses. It's in, uh, it's basically how science is done in the sense that with the, the evidence in favor of feathers uh, with the relative, the ancient relatives, it's very possible that they could have had feathers. It's also possible that maybe they didn't have feathers, but we do not know for certain quite yet. And I love that you bring up the uh, early Tyrannosaurid um, possibly having feathers because there's a lot of really interesting uh, evidence with early Tyrannosaurus rexes, especially um, that uh, they uh, they basically acted as a almost separate species because they were they were smaller and they were more agile and so uh, they filled a different niche in the ecosystem when they were younger and then as they got larger and bigger um, they filled a separate niche as a more of a top predator and so there's a lot of fossils actually um, that paleontologists debate about if they they find it in North America they say, oh, this is a young Tyrannosaurus rex. This is a juvenile. And then others say, oh, no, this is not a juvenile T-Rex. This is a separate species. And so that's where a lot of in interesting um, debates come from and stem from is uh, T-Rex and its life history because T-Rex is a very cool dinosaur. Yeah, it's really neat that within this field, um, so, so, so many of the science illustrators that I've worked with over the years and whose art I really love is very much about like depicting accuracy in a really beautiful way. And they're they're using pictures or they're going out into the field and they're directly observing. But um, but this form of art has this amazing um, kind of like mental game that um, that doesn't exist as much in, in a lot of other forms of science illustration, which seems really compelling and interesting. And kind of on that note, Rose has a question about you mentioned referencing other artists. Um, because, you know, we don't have all of this information. We've got to kind of um, like use the data that's out there and, and figure it out. Um, she's curious, would you recommend referencing other artists work, um, but not heavily, especially if they have had a job in science? Like, how do you determine 
when you're looking at a reputable piece of science illustration that you can use as a reference for your work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I always, whenever I see a new uh, science illustration that I see, or just a really kind of interesting um, bit of paleo art, uh, I always look up the person. And usually these people have their own websites as science illustrators or paleo artists. And so I look at their website and I determine from the pieces that they've made um, how they get there and how, what kind of um, what kind of references they make to make the paleo art that they do. Um, and so uh, I have really great examples of like Gabriel Igueto, who I already mentioned was an amazing paleo artist. And he actually originally was a herpetologist who studied reptiles. And already right there, you know that this guy is legit because he is very much uh, grounded in science and is very uh, clear on literature. And also too, I know of a great many paleo artists who have not had a background in science, um, who do not come from scientific backgrounds, who come from art, uh, art uh, schools and universities. But equally, they can also be quite amazing paleo artists because they are committed to the scientific literature. Um, and you can see that in their pieces. And so what you kind of get an eye if once you start to see these science illustrations more and more and these paleo art uh, pieces, you can kind of see where people are kind of going out on a limb. Like I'm gonna make a T-Rex with purple feathers. Like, I don't know if that's, if that's accurate um, versus a person who uh, makes feathers uh, that are similar to a turkey because they were, uh, they're closely related um, in that sense with birds. Um, but also too, I will point out that if you are a huge fan of some paleo artist's work and you want to do that same dinosaur in a very similar style, please do not try to copy uh, that paleo artist's piece. Um, it is uh, their piece, it is their personal art. Um, so if you were to make that piece and then put it on Instagram and say, I was the one who made this piece and this is my piece. Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> please try to, if you can, what I really love doing is looking at other paleo artists and uh, if I can um, take little pieces of inspiration from each of them to create kind of a chimera of what will be my paleo art, I find that is good in that it doesn't step on anybody's toes and it makes my paleo art unique and original. Yeah, um, and you were mentioning partnering up with the director of the ALF Museum when you first started your internship there. I, um, we have a great talk that I'll share in a follow-up email to everyone who registered for tonight's event, but it's from Jen Christensen, who also went through the science illustration program when it was at UCSC, and she's now um, she now works for Scientific America, and um, she you know talks a lot about those relationships with these researchers where you can be focusing on a field that you really don't know that much about but the skill set is really in being able to um it's it's a form of science communication so it really is like understanding what the researcher is sharing with you and what their goals are and then using your artistic skills to be able to um present that which i think is fascinating yeah, exactly. um, We've also, we have a couple of other questions that have come up. Um, one of them is from Hannah, who also loves drawing paleo art. And um, she is curious, how do you handle skin textures, feathers, scales? Do you have any tips? Yeah, so um, with scales, they are quite tricky um, because if you look at, uh, say if, if you were going to illustrate a dinosaur, um, like a T-Rex, but you want to be very particular and clear on scales. We have impressions of dinosaur scales, um, but I sometimes like to uh, get inspiration from scales, say from living reptiles and crocodiles. And you'll notice if you look at pictures of uh, these scales that sometimes the, uh, the indication of dark and light is reverse in what you might think. And so when you think of scales, you might think of, oh, I'm going to outline each and every scale. Um, but you'll actually find sometimes too that the darkest part of the scale is actually on the scale itself. And then the uh, surrounding tissue around the scale is actually lighter. 
Um, and so it's a little bit of a brain twister. Uh, and so it's really helpful in the sense that uh, when you're making scales to essentially break your mind down and break down these um, previous ideas that you have of what you think uh, the feather or the scale or, um, or the specific piece of hair or something that you're looking at, what it should look like. And instead try to find um, real life pictures of an animal today and really stare at that picture and say, okay, where am I seeing dark and where am I seeing light? And how can I make those transitions? Um, and so uh, that's my advice is that uh, you really need to look at the pictures and really break them down and break down your um, previous uh, notions of what you think a feather looks like and what a scale looks like and try to determine uh, what it actually looks like uh, in your piece in relation to how the light touches it and the shadows. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend this kind of really staring at a feather yeah. <laughs> or a scale if possible. And coming by the museum is a great opportunity to be able to do that. We have a monthly program that's called Nature Journal Studio, which yeah. is all about that, just like really looking at things more closely and honing your observational skills. And so people are totally welcome to join us for that. And we're surrounded inside the museum by things with feathers. And Oh, you know. yes, absolutely. <laughs> and anything, if you have any kind of uh, thing you want to look up in the museum, the shelves, the uh, taxidermy creatures, the feathers, it's all there and you can find it there. Yeah. Um, we also got a question about process from um, Jonathan, which is more focused on the research side. And he's curious if you always have free access to the articles you need to read, or if you come across something that you don't have free access to, what do you do? Yes. So that is an unfortunate circumstance. <laughs> so when you look up on Google Scholar, um, it's free for anybody to look up on Google Scholar, by the way, just as you can look up anything on Google. Um, you can find Google Scholar very readily. And when you look up on Google Scholar, uh, a specific species, um, you will find all of the really cool um, publications, but you'll also see that a lot of them you can't read or you can't read yet because they're very new. Um, and so sometimes I luck out uh, if I'm looking at Google Scholar, if you go to the more right-hand side of the page, you'll see that it has an available PDF or HTML version that you can click on and open up. Um, but sometimes, uh, unfortunately, a lot of kind of the newer cutting edge uh, articles you have to pay for. And sometimes they're pretty reasonable, like maybe only $9 or $12 to read. Um, uh, and you could get a subscription to any particular, particular uh, literature paper. Um, uh, or you can also do what I do. Um, I follow Science Daily, uh, which is basically a website um, that publishes these short articles that are really concise and super awesome because they basically read the paper for you, especially if you don't have access to it. Um, you go to Science Daily um, and I see all of the new paleontological discoveries through there. And that's how I found out all about the hot topics today is through Science Daily. And they basically um, outline the new evidence given in this paper and they describe it. And sometimes there's, uh, there's a short kind of um, uh, description from the authors themselves, which is helpful because that's not in the paper. Um, and so you, you can get a really good understanding of the paper just from that. And that doesn't cost a thing. So I highly recommend if you can going on to Science Daily. And uh, I usually check it multiple times a week just because there's uh, many new discoveries that happen all the time. Cool. I've also um, heard from many folks that just emailing the authors often yields great. Yes, so yes. They have the ability to share it for free. <laughs> yes, that, and that is kind of a subject uh, that we won't get into too much, yeah. but basically when you pay for access to a paper uh, in a scientific journal, um, the money doesn't go to the authors, it goes to the journal itself. And so if you are willing to find the authors um, and communicate with them and ask for a copy of their beautiful paper, most likely they'll email it to you because just, just because they can, because they're, they're really not getting anything out of uh, any of the profit uh, that the journal has. Cool. Um, we also got a question from Nancy who was noticing that in your credits, um, you were, you know, listing paleo artists that were featured within your slideshow. 
And she noticed that a lot of them were male. And she's just curious if you're noticing any trends in the field of more um, female paleo artists um, becoming involved. Yes. So I'm really glad that you found uh, that out. That is a deficit that greatly saddens me in paleo art uh, and a lot of science illustration sometimes in general, because in the science world, especially in paleontology, it is very male oriented. Um, so a lot of uh, paleontologists that you will meet or hear about in the news or read about in the past are most likely white males. And, uh, and that is unfortunately too a lot in the paleo art realm as well. Um, and so I am all for uh, the female paleo artists and paleontologists out there, go for it. All of the diverse paleontologists out there, I love you. Um, they are out there and they hopefully are growing. Um, so if you're able to find those, them on Instagram and support them, I highly recommend it because the more diverse voices that we have, the more, uh, the better for the betterment of paleontology for the betterment of science. So, um, if you can find those, those folks out there, uh, give them a shout out and, and love them up. <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> um, and I'll just end on this last question from Hoku who's noticing um, the background of, of your screen. Yes. And yeah, I'm curious, are you in a museum right now? Can you tell us a little bit more about that setting? <laughs> yes, yes. I, well, actually this is a green screen, um, but this is actually a picture from inside the ALF Museum itself, the Raymond M. ALF Museum of Paleontology in Claremont. Uh, so if you come check us out at some point, we're in Southern California and we are a accredited paleontology museum and you can see from right behind me, uh, this is kind of a snapshot of our Mesozoic gallery. Um, so we have really cool specimens of uh, dinosaurs. And I also mentioned really cool footprints um, from the Paleozoic even, uh, really amazing stuff. We even have a fossil uh, baby Parasaurolophus dinosaur named Baby Joe. And he is the only complete uh, Parasaurolophus baby dinosaur skeleton in existence, um, and we have him here. And uh, so if you guys come check us out, uh, we'd love to see you. Um, we have really, really cool stuff here. Um, we love paleontology. Nice. And, um, we just got our second comment about your shirt as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's one of my favorite shirts. It has dinosaurs all over it. Yes, and Hoku also appreciates the dinosaur behind you um, in your green scheme. Oh, and does Hoku know who this is? Um, well, he said Allosaurus. Yes, <laughs> Good job, Hoku. yes. It At is this point, I believe anything Hoku says. <laughs> yeah, ding, ding, ding. A lot of people, Hoku, actually think right when they come around the corner and they see the skeleton, they think it's a T-Rex, but you are absolutely correct. It is an Allosaurus. Uh, we do have a um, specimen of a T-Rex skull, uh, not in this visual that you can see, but basically around the corner, um, we have a big T-Rex skull and a brain endocast, uh, so you can see what its brain looks like. So if you come out to our museum, we do have the pretty cool T-Rex stuff here too. Very cool. Um, and at our museum, we don't have dinosaur fossils because, spoiler, there there are we're not dinosaurs in the land around Santa Cruz or um, a lot of, of California. Yeah, most really. of California have dinosaurs sorry yeah but we have fossils of other ancient life like Anna mentioned the sea cow um ancient whales and even if you explore the garden around the museum there are um ancient whale fossils that are large and that were found at Capitola Beach and um so definitely come by the museum not only to uh look into Santa Cruz fossils but also the art of nature exhibit um and I'll be sending a follow-up email with more resources about that. And just um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and for your great questions and comments. And thank you so much, Hannah, for taking the time. This was wonderful. And I'm so happy for you and all the all the great things that you're doing. Uh, thanks, Marisa. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure uh, to be included tonight and have this presentation for all of you guys. And it was a total treat. So thanks all for coming. And please go see the Art of Nature show before June. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and Hannah, when I uh, kick everyone else out. You're going to get kicked out too. So um, it was great seeing you. Talk to All you right. Soon. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everybody. Everyone.